All right, it's time to get started. Welcome back. Uh, we do have our first homework due tomorrow, tomorrow night, before midnight. Um, check it out and send it in on grade school. Please let me know if you have problems with the grade school. I hope that everything's fine. I've already gotten some submissions, so thank you to you overachievers out there. There's no bonus for doing it early. Um, let me know if you have questions about it. Uh, I would be happy to try and help out. So we are talking about the nested intervals property. This is what we talked about last time. I actually wanted to start off by uh, talking about why this is true. Um, maybe even the P word. I wanted to talk about the proof of this. It's actually not so hard to, uh, to demonstrate the nested intervals property. Remember what it says? Uh, if you have nested closed intervals, then the intersection of all of them is not the empty set. So the picture you should have in your mind is something like a bunch of closed intervals like this. And nested means that each one is a subset of the previous ones. And then if, even if you have infinitely many of these going on forever, what you end up with, which is in all of them, is not the empty set. There is at least going to be one point in the uh, in all of the nested closed intervals. This is the nested intervals property. Um, this uh, falls under the section of the book called consequences of completeness. So the proof of this involves the completeness axiom, which I will remind you the completeness uh, axiom means that every bounded set has a two of each upper bound. Uh, so that is a key feature of the uh, of the proof of this theorem. Just some notation here. Like I said, the proof actually is not so hard to do. I'm going to give you some hints, and then I'm going to let you guys see if you can come up with with the proof. Um, the nesting, as far as these endpoints goes, the endpoints here they're called a n and b n, right? Uh, this is like a one and b one. This is a two and b two, etc. I would like to say here, nested means something very specific about the endpoints. It means that A1 is, it means A1 is less than or equal to A2, right? And A2 is less than or equal to A3. If you want to be cute about it, you can write it this way. That's what the nesting means. The left-hand endpoints, each time, they, they push a little bit to the right. Or maybe they stay the same. They are allowed to stay the same, if you want. And then what can you say about the Bs? The Bs is similar, but the other way around, right? And actually, so you could write, don't write this, because this is not actually what I want to say. You could write B1 greater than or equal to B2, right? B3. Um, this is true. But also, you can say these things are also every of every one of the B's is bigger than all of the A's, right? Just because of the way this picture works out. And so, actually, these guys, you can write this as like a big chain. This is less than or equal to dot dot dot, and then I can say B three less than or equal to B two less than or equal to B one, right? This is a good summary of what the nesting means. It means the A's. Sort of go left to right. The A's increase as you go up. And then all the B's are kind of decreasing. But all the B's are bigger than all the A's. And all the A's are smaller than all the B's. All right? So let's see if we can do, I want to do a proof. And like I said, once you have a basic idea, this is not so hard to do. Proof of the nested intervals property. There's one basic idea that you have to have, which in my opinion is not terribly obvious, but um, I'll just say we need to find a point inside um, all of the IMs, right? That's the whole point of this, is that the nested interval property, what it says, the theorem says, that the intersection is not empty which is to say there is something in all of the intervals. That's what it means for the intersection to be non-empty. We need to find a point which is inside all of the i n. And 
Uh, our main tool, this is my first hint, our main tool is the completeness axiom. So we will use the axiom of completeness. I'll put this sort of as a sidebar. We'll use the axiom of completeness, which says any bounded set has a suit. All right. What's, what's kind of difficult about this, getting started at least, is, I mean, on the picture here, can you find a point on the picture which is in all of these? I would say, yeah, maybe like around there. That looks like a point which is going to be in all of them, right? But how did I get that point? I just, I kind of looked at it and I, I drew a big, I drew it extra big and I drew it red. Um, the problem with writing this as a proof is you have to somehow say what that point is. Your job is we need to find a point. Okay, what is the point that's in all of these? Um, I just kind of drew it. Why exactly did I draw it right there? Well, I had to make it so that it's to the right of all the A's and to the left of all the B's. I suppose maybe that's why I put it right there. Anybody have an idea of a specific point that you can say, which you know that this point exists, perhaps because of something I wrote in the sidebar there. I'm trying to cook up a specific point out of nowhere. The axiom of completeness says that any bounded set has a suit. Any, any ideas? Can you think of a specific point? I'm going to say the soup of something because that's what that completeness actually says. The soup of the smallest of the intervals. This is a good idea. Maybe. Uh, the smallest of the intervals will, will be like way down here. It's pretty small, right? Yeah, the problem with that is there there is no smallest really. These there's infinitely many of them, and they continue to get smaller, probably at least. Another idea? How about the soup of the A's? This is exactly what I was going to say. The A's make a set of points, right? I could if I just consider the A's. Now I would have also accepted the inf of the B's, but it doesn't matter. These, um, since I'm talking about the soup in the axiom of completeness, the soup of the A's is what I want. These A's, they make a set. If I drew them all, say, on the same line, it would be like this, right? And they must have a soup. And if you believe the picture, that soup better be in all of the intervals. Although that, we have to explain exactly why that's true. But this is the basic idea to get started. So I'm going to consider, I will just say, let, I'll call it A, be the soup of all the AMs, all right? And our job now, so this is true, uh, or this exists, I'll just say this exists by the axiom of completeness. If you didn't have the axiom of completeness, there would be no way to say exactly what that point should be. Maybe you could use the word lim if you like calculus. So you just take the limit of the a's rather than the soup of the a's. The problem with taking the limit of the a's is there's no guarantee they converge. When you talk about limits, you have to worry about well, first of all, what does limb even mean? But a more deeper question, there's no guarantee that the A's converge. This exists by the axiom of completeness. Now, the axiom of completeness says any bounded set has a soup. Does anybody, if you're going to use the completeness axiom here, this set must be bounded, the A ends. Can anybody say, is that set definitely bounded? Bounded, remember, means there's some numbers that, some number bigger than all the A ends. That's, that's what bounded means. Um, AM is bounded above. That's a bounded. Bounded above. So it is it is appropriate to use the axiom of completeness. Can anyone, we can actually be very specific. Can anyone say? Give me an upper bound for the AMs. Yeah? B. What do you mean by B? Where what is B? I haven't actually said a B anywhere. I said A is the soup of the A's. Is it, is it maybe dumber answer, easier answer? Yeah. Inf of the B's, you could, that's too complicated. It's a dumber answer than that. B1, yeah, that's this one. All right, this is definitely an upper bound for all the A's. I think you are trying to be fancier than you have to be, yeah. 
An is bounded above by B1, right? And so you can use the axiom of completeness on that step. All right, great. Okay, so the remainder of the proof is we'll show that um, A is uh, is in this intersection, right? That's the point of the axiom of completeness is that there is a point in the intersection of all of the intervals. And this, now I don't know if you, if you like dealing with infinite intersections like this, this is a little intimidating to look at, but really all that means is in order to be in this infinite sequence, uh, infinite intersection, it's enough to show that a is in between a n and b n for every n, right? That's that's the same as saying it's in the whole intersection. Is that it's squeezed in between those endpoints, in in between all of them. That means that it is in all the intervals, right? A is in between a n and b n for every n. And from here, I said I was going to give you a hint and then let you guys try and do the rest. This is where I will leave it in your capable hands. So there's really two parts to proof here. So I'm going to say part one is to show x, x? I call it x on my paper. So first, show a is greater than or equal to a n for each n. Or how about, a, I'll, I'll just say before any of this, I'm going to say let n be a natural number. And then step one is to show A is bigger than AN, and then step two is to show B, uh, A is less than or equal to BN, all right? And these two steps involve the fact that A is the soup. That's all you know about A. The only thing which you can ever use about A is that A is the soup of the ANs. So the soup, of course, means least upper bound, I will tell you as another hint, one of these you use upper bound, and the other you use least, right? A is the least upper bound of the ANs. One of these you can prove by just using the fact that A is an upper bound of the ANs, and the other you use the fact that A is the least of the upper bounds. See what you think. I will give you a few minutes. Maybe I'll walk around and try and inspire you, and then we'll talk about it. I'm going to refresh your memory. Remember, all these numbers, A's and B's, they have this relationship. I put the A right in the middle there. Actually, we don't, we don't really know. The, the whole point of the proof is to show that the A really is right in the middle. So maybe I'll erase it from there. You should imagine the A right in the middle. What we know is A is the least upper bound of the A n. Let's just do that with A to our A n.
very level of progress as I walk around. We want more time to see what else talk about. Let's talk about it. Um, I saw some folks figure out the uh, the first part. I don't know about the second part. Maybe nobody got that far. I don't know. Um, show first of all, we have to show that a is bigger than a n. And remember, what we are assuming is this: a is the least upper bound of the a n. That's the definition of a. It's the soup of the a n. All right. So how do you know that a is bigger than one of the particular a n? Well, it's because a is an upper bound, uh, right? In fact, it is the least upper bound. But um, I will say since a is an upper bound, for this set, a n, we know that a is greater than or equal to a n. And that's what we have to show in this part, right? Because it's an upper bound. How do you know it's upper bound? That's because the definition of a is that it's the soup least, least upper bound. And in this part, I don't care about least, but it is an upper bound. And so that means a is bigger than or equal to e to the a n. All right. This is what I meant here. I said use upper bound. I didn't. I didn't use the fact that it's the least. And actually, the least comes in uh, the second part. What? Why does it matter that a is the least of the upper bounds? Anybody think about the second part? The second part does involve some other upper bounds. Yeah. Mm hmm. I hear that. Because of just the way these numbers look here, every bn is also an upper bound for the a's, right? And since a is the least of the upper bounds, I'm going to say this part, bn, is an upper bound for the a's, and a is the least upper bound That means A is less than or equal to BN. BN is some other upper bound. A is the least, and so A has to be less than the BN. And that's it. Put a nice big tune on there. All right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily. I would say if you wrote exactly the words that I wrote, that would be great. I mean, you, I don't expect you to write exactly what I would have written, but yeah. Um, yes, if, you, uh, if, if you're writing proof and I don't like it, I will tell you. And then, yeah, uh, but I, I think there are uh, as usual, there are many ways to say any of these things. You said something similar, as long as it's correct. All right, great. That is all I wanted to say about the nested intervals property. It's an important thing. Uh, it is a consequence of the completeness axiom. All right? I got one other thing to talk about, another important consequence of the completeness axiom. This one, the um, nested intervals property, is a little far out, I guess. It's a little abstract, talking about an, inter an infinite intersection of intervals. This one is quite a bit more concrete, and this is something that you could explain to any kid, this thing that we're about to talk about. This is another consequence of the completeness axiom. Another consequence of the axiom of completeness. It's called the Archimedean property of the real numbers. The Archimedean property. This is something that any kid knows about the real numbers. You can explain this to your moms, uh, and they will understand what you're talking about. I don't mean to suggest that your moms are uneducated. My mom was a math major, uh, so she probably doesn't remember the Archimedean property, but I'm sure she learned it at some point when she took a real analysis class. Um, the Archimedean property is a basic fact about the real numbers, and it has to do with the relationship between, um, it has to do with the relationship between R and N, the natural numbers. Uh, what is the relationship? Well, N is a subset of R, and if this is the real line, the N 
is like starts at one in our textbook at least and it goes like this etc if someone asks me what exactly uh, how would you describe the natural numbers inside the real numbers I would say it's like that they're kind of they go one after another they're kind of spread out like that and they go on forever the natural numbers inside the real numbers they do not bunch up at any particular point uh, they go on forever and they are evenly spaced actually the Archimedean property is not about evenly spaced but it is about the fact that they go on forever um, I will uh, I'll, I'll write the statement of the Archimedean property actually there's I'm gonna talk about two versions there's what I will call the big version and the small version. This is the this picture has to do with the big version, which is basically that the natural numbers go on forever and they get really big, just right alongside the real numbers getting really big. So I'm gonna say this is the Archimedean property. This is kind of the original uh, version of the Archimedean property as as articulated by Archimedes. He actually did talk about this, uh, the big version. with modern language it just says this so when you think properly about this you will decide this is fully obvious for any x a real number there exists n a natural number with n greater than x for any real number there is a natural number that's bigger than that real number. So think of any any real number you like, like uh, 1,503.7. Is there a natural number bigger than that? The answer is yes, 1,504, right? I rounded it up. Another way of saying that is, in the real numbers, you can round it up to get a natural number, which is always bigger than the, the real number that you said it is, all right? This is the Archimedean property Big version. I call it the big version because it's really, this is about big numbers. It's about no matter how big the real number you choose, there's always a natural number that's a little bit bigger. All right. This is kind of what I said about like the natural numbers, they don't clump up anywhere or they don't just like stop after a while. They really go on forever. There are always big natural numbers. If you want a big natural number, there's always one there right next to your big real number. I thought for fun it might be fun to read this in Archimedes' own language. Because I, I, I looked this up because I was wondering, did Archimedes really say this? Um, here's, here's how Archimedes put this. I, I, uh, I made a screenshot in my photos. This is from a, a work of Archimedes called On the Sphere and Cylinder from 225 BC. It says, of unequal lines, unequal surfaces, and unequal solids, the greater exceeds the less by such a magnitude as, when added to itself, can be made to exceed any assigned magnitude. Huh? <laughs> How do you like that? This I had to read several times before it made any sense to me. But here's, uh, here's my interpretation of this. First of all, all of this business, Archimedes is talking about lines, surfaces, solids, but then he's talking about greater and lessers. So really, my interpretation of all of that is numbers. Remember the Greeks, when they thought about numbers, everything to them was geometric in, in terms. So any number was somehow representative of a specific length or area or volume or something like that. So when Archimedes says that, he's just talking about if any two numbers, the greater exceeds the less by such a magnitude as when added to itself can be made to exceed any assigned magnitude. So I think what he's saying is, if you have any two numbers, the bigger one is bigger than the smaller one. And if you sort of uh, increase the scale enough, it can be as big as you want. The bigger one can be uh, as big as you want, which kind of means this somehow um, I think one way of saying this is I'm not really sure if, if I would call these the same idea although I think I'm not a historian I'm not an expert on Archimedes but I think the way that Archimedes uses this principle is is similar to how we would describe that yeah he doesn't yeah he doesn't mention the natural numbers I think this is an aspect of the fact that Archimedes would have viewed all numbers basically as rational numbers 
which are kind of like natural numbers but made into fractions. Like Archimedes had no concept of the the uh, the difference between. I mean, Archimedes didn't think of the real numbers in the way that we do, as like irrationals living together in harmony with rational numbers <coughs> and all having distances which can be measured. So there is there is a quite a bit of I would say. Uh, an ideological journey you have to go through to translate this into this. But the name, this name for this fact was, I believe, decided in like the 1800s at some point. Somebody came up with this basic property of the real numbers and decided to call it the Archimedean property. Because they're like, oh, that sounds kind of like this. And I will leave it to you to think to decide how similar that really is. Yeah. Yes. It is? Okay. Yes. But then, but then it's always a natural number greater than? Greater than any specific real number. But isn't that natural number also a real number? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it is. But, um, yes. So you could say, maybe you're imagining, what if I said this, right? Instead, that, because this is also true, that if you have any big real number, you can always find an even bigger real number, right? right? But uh, that is less interesting. I mean, it, it's not saying the same thing as what the Archimedean property is trying to say is it's telling you sort of like, where are the natural numbers inside the real number line? And the answer is they are like evenly dispersed everywhere. They don't just go up to a certain point and then stop. Um, you could also, um, the, that's the point of this, is answering this question, where are the natural numbers situated inside of the real numbers? If you do the red version, that would be an answer to the question of like, where are the real numbers inside of the real numbers, which is an even really question. Yeah. All right, but I, I hope you agree. This is, this is a fact that everybody knows that, um, Another way of saying this, which makes it sound even more obvious, I would say the real numbers, um, I'll say it this way, no real numbers is bigger than every natural number, right? Because. Um, that's what it says is no matter what real number you have, there's always a natural number that's bigger. The op, the, uh, this is sort of like the contrapositive. There's no such thing as a real number that's bigger than every natural number. Right? No real number is bigger than every natural number. How do you like that? I used the number sign over here, but I wrote out the word number over here. And I used the fancy n over here, but I wrote out the word real over here. I can't be controlled. So, <laughs> so there is a natural number that's greater than every guy. But not a real one, but not. No, there's no. I'm trying to say, like, 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 real numbers are like in between the natural. That's right. But the, like, what I'm saying, like, does that mean is a natural number bigger than? Is it just like bigger than a certain real number, or can there be a natural number bigger than like? Yeah, the, that that's an important distinction. It means if you if you focus on a specific real number, there's always a natural number that's bigger. Oh. But it's not true that there's some like one mother natural number that's bigger than every real number. That's oh. not true. Yeah. Right. All right. No real number is bigger than every natural number. Actually, there's a, yet another way to say this, which is even more sort of basic in terms of our language, it's just uh, n, the set n, is not bounded above, right? These are all equivalent ways of saying the Archimedean property, the big version. The natural numbers are not bounded above. That is to say, there is no real number that's bigger than every natural number. It's the same thing that I just said. Right? That's what it means to say n is not bounded above. All right. I want to see, we got time, we can do, uh, I want to talk about why this is true. I mean, it's in, it sounds like an obvious fact, but uh, if you want to prove it, 
It turns out, in order to prove this, you must use the completeness axiom. You cannot prove this using basic facts about numbers. It must involve the completeness axiom. So let's see if we can do this. Uh, this I'm going to write as my statement of the theorem. This is equivalent to that stuff that I said upstairs, up there about, um, you know, if x is any real number, then there exists n with n greater than x. Uh, this is an easier way to say it, though. n is not bounded above. This is the Archimedean property, the big version. And then we'll, we'll talk about the small version after, uh, after this. So I want to do the proof of this. We will use the axiom of completeness. Because that's kind of our, our topic for these few days. All right, I want to show that the natural numbers are not bounded above. Uh, oftentimes, the way to show something is not whatever is a, a proof by contradiction. So that's how I want to do this. Let's assume that it is bounded above, and then we will somehow explain why that's not possible. So uh, I will begin like this. For the sake of a contradiction, I'm going to assume and the natural numbers is bounded above. All right, so that means there's some real number that's bigger than every natural number. Now, um, in order to reach a contradiction, actually, I could, I could give it a name for this upper bound. Um, actually, this upper bound by itself is not going to do it. I intend to use the axiom of completeness, which remember says, any set which is bounded above has a soup. We can use it immediately here to get a specific upper bound. If I assume that n is bounded above, then n has a soup. There is a least upper bound, which is a real number. Then by the axiom of completeness, n has a soup, which is a real number. And I'm going to call it uh, s, as I usually do. Soup of the natural numbers. This is a proof by contradiction. I would feel like a fool if a, if a uh, campus tour walked by right now and they see this let s equal the soup of n. What an idiot in there. Of course, n doesn't have a soup. But this is because this is a proof by contradiction. You would not, don't say in public, let s equal the soup of n without that context. The context is important. All right? Um, so in particular, s is a real number, right? That's part of the axiom of completeness. The soup exists, and it is a real number. All right, so we have now a hypothetical real number that's bigger than every natural number, all right? And I want to derive contradiction from that. Um, I begin to feel like I'm having sort of a, a playground discussion with the kids about infinity. I don't know if you ever talked about infinity on the playground with the other kids. I, I do from time to time. People talk about infinity. People talk about infinity plus one, this kind of thing. Um, you can imagine some, something like S here represents something like infinity. It's something which is bigger than all the other real numbers. Everybody knows infinity is not a number, it's like a concept, but it, you can't treat it like a number. But actually, as part of our proof by contradiction here, we have actually something which is allegedly a number, an actual number, which, um, which uh, is kind of acting like infinity. So in this case, what with the, uh, with the kids on the playground, you can, you can actually think about what, what would S plus one look like. Um, actually, in this example, it's a little more interesting to think about what would S minus one look like. Because S is supposed to be, you know, you have the natural numbers, N, right? And S is the soup of those, which means it's supposed to be like the point on the right side of that set, which is as close as possible to the, to the other things on that set. So if I consider S minus 1, then very strange things begin to happen about what, it, what is, uh, well, anyway, that's what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go there. Uh, consider S minus 1, which is also a real number, right? Because every real number, you can subtract one and get another real number. Um, what's weird about this is that S is supposed to be the soup of all those things. But when I subtract one from the soup, it is no longer the soup anymore. Because uh, the soup is the least of the upper bounds. So when you go a little bit smaller, it's not the soup anymore. Which means there's some natural number to the right. So on this picture here, I have S here, S minus 1. S minus 1 is not an upper bound for this set uh, of natural numbers, which means in there, 
there has to be some natural number n. So I will say since s is the soup of n and s minus 1 is less than s, that means s minus 1 is not an upper bound for n. And so that means there is a natural number in between s minus 1 and s. Yeah? See, I don't get that. Yeah, 1 is the smallest. So we had a theorem last time that said if you have the soup of a set and then you instead look at s minus epsilon for any epsilon, then s minus epsilon is not an upper bound anymore. So actually, it's not really important that I use 1 here. I could have said s minus a half or something, but it's because of some tricks that we're going to do later on in the proof. It's convenient to use 1. Yeah, it's, it's, just, it's a fact that if s is the soup, it means, I mean, this is not actually the way it is, but because this is a proof by contradiction, but it means somehow that the natural numbers are, are bunching up and approaching the s. And so no matter what you subtract, you're going to get a bunch of natural numbers in between there. All right, so s minus 1 is not an upper bound for n. That's because s is the soup. So if I decrease it at all, it's not an upper bound anymore. So there exists n, a natural number, with s minus 1 less than n, less than or equal to s. All right? s is an upper bound. s minus 1 is not. So the s minus 1 is less than this natural number. Yes? Uh, if s really is the soup here, and I consider instead s plus 1, uh, I don't get anything in between there. Actually, there are no natural numbers in between there. I went, I went minus 1 because I wanted to get a natural number in between. No. All right. And now I'm going to do sort of a, a playground trick, I guess. You know, the uh, if you ask a kid, maybe, I don't know if a kid will think, think this through, but if you ask a kid if there's such a thing as the biggest number, is there a biggest number? My answer to that question is no, there's not a biggest number because every number you could add one, and it'd be a little bit bigger. So it wasn't the biggest number, right? Uh, I'm going to do that to this, right? And here, if I add one throughout this whole inequality, I get s less than m plus 1 less than equal to s plus 1, right? And this is a contradiction. Did anyone say why? Why is that a contradiction? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. It's because right here I have n plus 1. n is a natural number. n plus 1 is also a natural number. This is a fact about the natural numbers. If you add 1 to a natural number, the answer is also a natural number. And like she said, s was supposed to be the soup of all the natural numbers, but here we have s being less than a natural number. And that's the contradiction. So here, s is an upper bound. for all natural numbers, but n plus 1 is a natural number. Say it again. And s is less than n plus 1. So this is the contradiction. s is supposed to be an upper bound for all the natural numbers, but this is a natural number that's bigger than that. All right. In my opinion, that this is a very sort of a simple and obvious idea. Although you do have to be a little, a little cute about writing the proof correctly. I mean, it's not obvious how to make this argument string this together so that it all works. Um, this, by the way, is why I subtracted one rather than subtracting anything else. You could have subtracted something else, but the whole point was to add one in this step and make it uh, n plus one. All right. That's the Archimedean property, the big version. It says no matter how big a real number is, there's always a natural number that's a little bit bigger. All right? And 
in our remaining eight minutes, I want to talk about the small version, which is the small version is actually easy once you've already done the big version. Uh, but this is also a fact which is, I would say, everybody also knows this fact, although this one is a little more obscure. It has to do with, so the small version is about um, fractions like 1 over n, all right? 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, etc. This is another way of thinking about the natural numbers. So the natural numbers themselves kind of go out to infinity, but if you think about the natural numbers like this as denominators to fractions, instead of going out to infinity, they kind of go to zero. You get a half, then a third, then a fourth, then a fifth. They get, they get smaller as you go. So there's, you know, 1 over 1, here's zero, 1 half, one third, one fourth, etc. And the Archimedean property, the small version, is about these numbers, which is why I call it the small version. Our book doesn't call it the small version of the big version. They call it, I think, A and B. They just write it with like two parts. Less interesting. All right. This this Archimedean property is about this thing, and this one is about small numbers. So if uh, it it still says something about for any real number x. There exists blah, blah, blah. What it says, though, is if you choose any x, even if the x is really little, there's always a fraction that's even less. That's what the uh, Archimedean property, the small version, says. So it says, this is the Archimedean property, the small version. It says, um, for any real number, x, Well, I'll say x greater than zero. I don't want to deal with going off to the left side of this picture. For any x greater than zero, you imagine x is small. This is only interesting if x is a really small number. There exists n in the natural numbers such that and 1 over n is less than x. That's the small version. All right. So speaking informally, I would say the big version means no matter how big your number is, there's a natural number that's even bigger. The small version says no matter how small your number is, there's a natural number of fraction, 1 over n, which is even small. That's what the small version says. All right? This also is, I think, an obvious fact that everybody knows, although maybe, maybe a little less obvious. But. All right? Let's, uh, let's do... The proof. We got six minutes. This uh, this is actually quite easy if you've already done the proof of the big one. So we're just going to use the big one as part of this. So the proof here. I'll tell you the strategy first. Any any you could all do this on your own, but we've only got five minutes. Um, I'm going to say uh, take reciprocals of everything and then use the big one. That's my advice because on this picture. If you just think, what happens when you take the reciprocal of this picture? All these 1 over n's turn into n's. And th these red dots sort of bunching up at 0 just turn into red dots going off to the right forever, which is the same as the big version picture of the Archimedean property. So let's see if we can do this. I'm going to say let x be greater than 0, because that's what we start with. And I have to find some natural number such that 1 over n is less than x. All right. I'm going to take the reciprocal, okay, then 1 over x greater than 0. Is that true? Yeah. If you have a positive number, you go 1 over that, it's also a positive number. And here, I can use the big version of the Archimedean property. Then by the big version, there exists a natural number n such that. What does the big version say here? I'm using the big version with 1 over x instead of x. Yeah? Right. So it means this natural number is bigger than 1 over x. Right? That's what the big version says. There's always a bigger natural number. So there exists n a natural number such that n greater than 1 over x. All right? 
Can anyone see how to make this happen? This is our, our conclusion is up here. This is what we want to end up with. Can you get there from here? Move the stuff around, all right? Then I can multiply both sides by x, for instance. xn greater than 1. Do I have to change the direction of the inequality sign? This is the first rule of Fight Club. When you multiply by a negative number on both sides, you have to change it. But x is positive. We said that over there, right? So you do not have to change it. And then I divide both sides by n. x greater than 1 over That's what we needed to show, right? So this is just sort of playing some games. The, the big one the, is the one that requires the real proof. You could also prove the little one directly using the axiom of completeness, and then by reciprocal prove the big one starting from here. All right, that's the Archimedean property. I think we'll leave it at that.